Jim Fogel from the University of California, Berkeley. For those of you who don't know uh, David, he has been at the, the house business for, uh, for a long time, since 1973. And uh, since we speak about uh, long time periods, he has also been uh, editor of California Management Review since 1982, I believe. And so that makes, uh, he has been around for a long time. David's work uh, covers a variety of topics. Uh, he has a forthcoming book on uh, risk, perception and management, uh, different sides of the ocean. And uh, he has also done work comparing regulative, uh, regulatory regimes in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, well known uh, also for his book uh, Trading Up, uh, where he coined the term California effect, which is now used all over. Uh, in, in a lot of uh, circles, and therefore um, I'm uh, very happy to have uh, David here, who will speak about private global business regulation, hopefully with a lot of environmentally relevant uh, examples. So I leave the, the floor. Off thank to you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I've done a lot of work over the years on um, on, uh, on private global business regulation. Um, and published a book a few years ago called The Market for Virtue. And what I want to do is sort of review some of that um, work which I've done in the past, but also um, uh, suggest some new ways of thinking about these topics uh, which, are, which are, have occurred to me. So I want to begin with the notion that we have a lot of global environmental problems, um, problems of fishery depletion, forest depletion, degradation, electronic waste, climate change, etc. a whole series of, of major global environmental problems. Um, and the question is, um, are these global environmental problems um, are very much linked to uh, global supply chains, where we have a substantial amount of uh, management activity taking place in the richer countries of the world, and supply chains extending into um, poor developing countries. And so these global supply chains, um, uh, which have consumed you know, major resources in, around the world and bring them to bear for, for consumption, um, create a lot of environmental problems, uh, which are of the global scale. Okay. Um, that is to say, they affect more than one country, um, uh, and we're, you know, where will it will be aware of this. Okay, so that's sort of fairly obvious. Um, now, how, would, how does the world go about addressing these problems? Um, well, there are two sort of uh, you know, obvious uh, uh, possibilities. Okay. One is uh, international treaties, where countries get together and they voluntarily agree to adopt common standards for fisheries, forestry, climate change, uh, whatever. Okay? Um, and um, the, the uh, record of this is, I think, pretty mixed. I think it's probably fair to say that in the 70s and 80s, uh, we had a lot of progress, a lot of important environmental treaties, most involving for example, ozone depletion, uh, uh, endangered species, ocean dumping and sea, a dramatic explosion of global environmental law um, over a period of two decades, which I think has you know, addressed some serious problems. Um, since the last 20 years, uh, the, uh, the pace and significance of global environmental governance, by which I mean to say global environmental laws, treaties, um, has, has become much, much, much weaker, much smaller. Uh, the main reason for this um, is that uh, two of the most important potential signatory countries that would be needed to participate in effective global environmental laws, namely the United States and China, are excluded from this process for different reasons. The United States has not uh, ratified an environmental treaty for over 20 years. Uh, basically, uh, it has sort of removed, its, removed itself from an active role in global environmental governance. China, of course, for its own reasons, is obviously reluctant to, to participate in um, new global environmental laws. So we have the European Union, of course, playing a leadership role in many other countries, but basically uh, the absence of the U.S. and China um, is quite consequential. So that means that on the whole, um, there are a lot of important global environmental problems uh, which are not being effectively addressed by countries, by two treaties. Okay. The second um, mechanism um, is uh, through trade policy, where in principle, um, uh, relatively developed or greener countries could um, uh, uh, restrict uh, imports of um, products and production uh, from, uh, from, you know, from developing countries which have weaker environmental standards. Uh, a lot of debate about this, of course. Um, 
W World Trade Organization rules uh, generally uh, make it hard to do so, um, uh, make it very hard to restrict imports on environmental grounds, um, and of course there really isn't much support for doing so. Basically, doing so would of course disrupt global supply chains, would raise the costs of products sold in the rich countries, um, and obviously would be a disadvantage to uh, exporters in developing countries. So there really isn't much of it on the whole, with a few exceptions here and there, uh, there's not really much of a constituency um, for, um, for trade restrictions. Um, give you an exception, which is very unusual, um, the government of Indonesia, just to you know, give you a hopeful example, but very atypical, the government of Indonesia has finally woken up to the problem of um, illegal forestry, illegal harvesting of timber, uh, becoming a big issue. The government has decided this is not good. This is wants to favor legal timber. Um, much of that timber goes to the U.S. Um, it worked out. Uh, U.S. Congress passed the legislation uh, prohibiting illegally harvested timber from coming into the United States. Uh, this, of course, reinforced the Indonesian government's regulations. It, and then, of course, you help and, and then the, um, uh, the Indonesian government, of course, supported a U.S. environmentalist. And so you basically you know, have a law passed by Congress saying uh, we're going to certify wood has to be harvested legally. Um, so that's a rare, you know, that's an example of a use of a trade restriction, which was, you know, supported by a developing country government as well as by a rich country. Uh, but those are, they become very difficult. Okay, so. We have, again, a lot of global environmental problems, um, and we have um, uh, limited global um, state resources to address them. So how are we addressing them? Well, one mechanism is, of course, which um, we're going to focus on, um, is this notion of uh, private governance, okay, where we uh, have laws, we have rules and regulations, uh, so-called soft law, non-state regulation, um, private authority, uh, where we basically um, create rules within the private sector uh, which govern various you know, practices, labor practices, environmental practices. Um, and these have really exploded. Okay? We roughly probably have three, four hundred uh, different rules, codes, and standards. Um, virtually every global industry that's traded, um, uh, forestry, fisheries, chemicals, computers, electronic equipment, apparel, rugs, coffee, Cocoa, palm oil, diamonds, gold, toys, minerals, mining, energy, tourism, financial services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, are bound by these sort of various um, uh, codes. Many of which involve, of course, environmental practices. Okay, um, uh, we uh, we have, for example, 16 different codes on food, um, uh, several on wood and paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so this is actually this so-called certification, which is how they often work, right? Which is basically we establish some standard, some private standard of good practice about how something is produced, say how palm oil is produced, for example, or wood products or fisheries. And then we impose those standards. Uh, and then um, uh, Western companies agree to ad adopt these standards. Um, they then impose them on uh, their suppliers in developing countries. Um, and we have um, essentially a private set of private rules. Um, which are, um, you know, which basically um, affect we import um, products and services from poorer countries and we export our standards to them. These all take place with the market. These are all private. They're all voluntary. They're all exempt from World Trade Organization scrutiny because none of them involve state policy. None of them involve laws. Okay. Uh, many of them work through um, certification rules, etc., um, and um, and various sort of codes. Now, um, what do we know about these standards? Um, there's a lot of literature on them, a uh, growing line of studies, because there are hundreds and hundreds of these codes. Okay? One thing we know is that there are a lot of them, and they keep on growing. Uh, more and more sectors are covered by them. The other thing we know is that more and more sectors have multiple codes. We have three codes on finance. We have 16 private labels on food. Okay? Um, we have um, nine, uh, nine private labels on textiles, uh, six on tourism, six on wood and paper. In other words, we have this enormous explosion of these private certifications. Let's give you one example. These are, these are a lab of green labels, uh, which are used in the United States. Green Seal, Energy Star, Design for the Environment, Water Sense, 
Forward Stewardship Council, Scientific Certification System, Echo Label, Green Guard, Cradle to Gradle, Electronic Product Environmental Assessment, Global Organic Test Dolls, Biodegradable Products Institute, Blue Score, Totally Chlorine Free, um, uh, Rug Institute's Green Label. Okay. If you look at coffee, for example, we have fair trade coffee, we have shade grown coffee, we have organic coffee, etc., etc., etc. So, this of course is what happens when you leave things up to the market, which is to say anyone can create a code, anyone can create a certification, and we have this profusion, this enormous amount of um, certification, uh, so that many, many sectors um, are subject to um, multiple interpretations. So, for example, take wood, big deal, okay? Uh, you want you can be certified by the American Tree System, by the Canadian System, by the Forest Stewardship Council, by the International Tropical Timber Organization, by the Pan-European Forest Certification, and by the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that the proliferation of these certifications and of codes is very confusing to consumers. Um, and people don't really, you know, some of them have cachet, like fair trade, but on the whole, rug mark maybe, on the whole, there's a lot of confusion. Okay. So, on one hand, so the good news is we have a lot of certifications. You, you, want, to, you, know, you want to go to a green resort, okay? We have certifications, which green, you know, certify uh, you know, green, uh, green tourism practices. Uh, you, want to, uh, uh, you want to develop or build or buy a green building, office building. We have a whole bunch of certification standards for you know, green office construction. Um, you wish to purchase um, lumber, you're a forestry product company, you're a, um, a, a builder, and you want to uh, buy responsibly harvest wood. Uh, we have a whole bunch of standards that you can use uh, to, to, um, to, judge, to, uh, to make those decisions. So that information is on the whole helpful, okay? It gives people choices, um, but it's also confusing. Now, what impact has all this had on um, the real world? You know, it's, it's, the answer is it's pretty uneven, okay? We have some success stories. If you look at forestry, we have about 7% of global forests are sort of certified in some way, but most of them are in developed countries, not in poor countries. If you look at fisheries, we have a big problem of global ozone depletion, the global fishery depletion, of course. Again, um, most of the certified fisheries are not, you know, the real danger there in relatively developed countries as well. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at the whole sort of story, um, uh, I think, you know, one can cite examples of progress, and they certainly have made Western firms much more aware of, um, of how the products are made, which was not true, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so that's all sort of true and important. Um, what impact they've had, it's unclear. Um, how good are these standards? How good are these certifications? Uh, which are credible, which are not. Uh, which are tougher, which are less tough, which are deceptive. You know, it's, a, it's complicated out there, okay? And I think on the whole, most consumers, most of the time, have a pretty dim awareness of any of these certifications, with a few exceptions, fair trade. But on the whole, most people have a pretty limited idea. That, you know, the EU has an echo label and the flower, et cetera. So, you know, that's sort of useful. But again, you know, what happens is that as soon as one firm gets certified, all the others get certified. Hard to know what's going on. Anyway, so I think, you know, the, the, um, the evidence, um, the evidence um, on the impact of all this is uh, still unclear, okay? Um, and, um, you know, there are some cases of pretty effective codes and pretty effective certifications. Um, a lot of them are very controversial. There's a lot of debate about how, how much impact they're having, how easy it is to get them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, I think one of the problems uh, remains in that uh, most of this pressure comes from companies. Individual consumers on the whole are, on the whole, in most cases, you know, pretty indifferent to these standards. Um, people care about them to the extent that it benefits them, like organic, and they feel it's healthy for them. But once you get beyond our energy efficiency, well, you know, it makes it easier for you to spend less money on your energy bill.